an honor and a pleasure to be invited here in this prestigious place. Uh, so <coughs> I'll be talking about inference problems uh, uh, and especially tree reconstruction and community detection. So let me uh, uh, say a few words about the, the kinds of inference problems that we have in mind uh, in, in this uh, area. Uh, <coughs> Uh, if you take the first one, community detection, typically the, the task consists in processing a graph which uh, represents relationships between entities and uh, you want to cluster these entities into groups such that nodes within a group are statistically similar. So the, the picture on the top is the uh, graph of uh, uh, quotations between bloggers uh, in the US and somewhere Republicans, somewhere uh, Democrats, and just by looking at the graph, you can recover who's a Democrat, who's a Republican, and that, that's what this picture illustrates. So this is a very generic uh, task, committee detection, and that, that will be a focus of this, uh, of this talk. Uh, a second one where we are trying to uh, retrieve some structure hidden in a, a large data set is that of graph alignment. Uh, so I'm giving this example just to, to show that there are many uh, 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 um, problems beyond that of community detection. So graph alignment is the task of, given two graphs, find a mapping of the vertices in one graph to the vertices in the other graph so that you have more or less a, a graph isomorphism. And you have many tasks uh, that, that can be uh, phrased as a graph alignment problem, for instance, uh, uh, you can have a, a graph representing the interactions of users of a, a, an online social network and you may have on one such uh, graph identities that are revealed and you may have another graph representing interactions of users of another so, uh, online social network for which the identities are not revealed and so if you can find the isomorphism you can de-anonymize the second graph so that's one example but you have many more. So uh, there are algorithms for all of these tasks, there are plenty of algorithms, uh, but uh, it's hard to say which one is good, uh, what are the relative merits, what, what is the difficulty of the task at hand, so the philosophy of the, the work that I'm going to describe is, let's look at large random instances of these uh, 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 inference problems, and by analyzing those large random instances, we'll have a handle on the hardness of the task, is it difficult, uh, what kinds of algorithms will succeed, and we will be able to prove theorems about the feasibility of the task. Uh, and we may also develop new algorithms in, in the process of analyzing uh, the performance of existing ones. Okay, so uh, I'll be focusing on committee detection, you can forget about graph alignment for now, uh, and what I want to convey is this kind of picture. Uh, so. Uh, you, you have a large instance of a, a community detection problem. You're trying to recover blocks underlying the data set. Uh, and uh, by varying the parameters of your probabilistic model, your generative model of the task, you may have uh, three situations at least. So there are three depicted here. There is one set of parameters. So I'll, I'll uh, go over the meaning of the axes. Don't bother trying to figure out what they mean for now. Uh, you may have three different outcomes at least, one where the signal is just too weak, you cannot recover meaningful blocks from the observation of this large graph, uh, there, there's a too weak a signal to noise ratio, this is impossible. There's a situation where it's not only possible but uh, available polynomial time algorithms <coughs> can be shown to succeed at extracting the information, that's the easy task, that's the, that's the easy region, sorry. That's the triangle uh, in green on the left. And then in between, you have this uh, very puzzling uh, region where you have signal, you know you can extract it in exponential time, but uh, <coughs> you don't know whether a polynomial time algorithm exists that will succeed at extracting the signal. And so you can take a point in this diagram, move up, increasing the signal to noise ratio and cross boundaries, so the red line would be an information theoretic threshold, that's where uh, useful information appears in your data set, and when you cross the blue line, then that's uh, a computational threshold, that's when the problem becomes easy, whereas it was, it was feasible but hard uh, between, uh, before that. Okay, so uh, 
that's what I want to convey for the particular problem of community detection. But before doing that, I'll go over the tree reconstruction problem, which is, uh, which is uh, interesting in its own right, and uh, which also paves the way for the understanding of this community detection problem. All right, so uh, here's the outline. I'll, I'll uh, uh, describe two phase transitions that occur in the problem of uh, tree reconstruction. Then I'll move to community detection related to the uh, uh, tree reconstruction problem. Uh, <coughs> talk about the three phases, so uh, showing that a hard phase exists indeed. Uh, show that uh, uh, above the so-called kesten stigum threshold, we can indeed uh, recover uh, the hidden information in polynomial time. And then uh, the last bit I want to cover uh, is a link between uh, a study of this community detection problem and a random matrix theory. All right. Uh, so let's start with a true reconstruction. Uh, and I'm missing a picture on that slide, so I'll, I'll start using the choke on the board. So <coughs> here's the, the setup. We have a genealogy tree, and so we have an ancestor or a root uh, at the top of the tree, and then we have uh, children, uh, and <coughs> uh, the root has a trait that could be color of its size, whether blue or brown, and uh, these traits are passed from uh, uh, father to son or mother to daughter, if you prefer, uh, in, a, uh, in a probabilistic manner. And so uh, we can look at the tree uh, down to a depth D. And so we would have, uh, or node I at depth D, we would have a, a spin or a trait sigma I. And the rule for uh, transmission of traits in this model is, is probabilistic we have a, a, a stochastic matrix, P, which gives you the probability that uh, <coughs> sigma of uh, I equals T given sigma of the parent of I equals S. And so we'll assume this is an irreducible matrix. Uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, we'll denote by nu its uh, uh, stationary uh, distribution, so nu P equals nu. So, uh, I'm almost done with uh, specifying the model. The, the uh, uh, last thing I need to mention is that the uh, root uh, has a spin that is distributed according to the stationary measure, and uh, that these propagations are done independently of one another. So we have <coughs> a, a, a description of the process, uh, and um, the, the task informally is uh, given the tree to depth d, so I'll I'll add a bit of notation. Td would be the tree to depth d. I also denote by vd its uh, vertices, ed its edges, sorry, and by ld uh, <coughs> the set of depth d nodes. And so uh, the, uh, the question will be, can one uh, infer non-trivially the spin root from observation of the tree down to level D and the traits of the descendants. So it's as if today we looked at the colors of our eyes, we knew about the, gen the genealogy tree from us backwards to Eve or Adam, and uh, we wanted to figure out whether Adam had, had blue eyes or brown eyes, say. Okay? So <coughs> the number of, of, of children is, is fixed. Or <coughs> so right now I have not said uh, what the tree is. Uh, I will be assuming this is a Galton Watson branching tree, right? So uh, that, that will be my, my hypothesis throughout. Uh, so formally, what is the <coughs> definition of reconstructibility? We'll say that reconstructibility holds if the mutual information between the spin, uh, the spin at the root that we're interested in and the um, information GD, which is the tree down to level D plus the spins at depth D, uh, does not vanish as D goes to infinity. All right? uh, I, I assume uh, I don't need to re recall what mutual information is to this audience. Don't hesitate if it's uh, convenient to read it. All right. So, I of uh, x, y, the mutual information between two random variables 
x and y would be the entropy of x minus the entropy of x given y. And this would be sum of the values that uh, it can take of uh, the probability that it takes that value times the log of 1 of the probability that it takes this value. And uh, uh, conditional entropy would be uh, the same uh, with a sum over xy, probability that x is x, y is y, uh, log of 1 over probability that x equals x given y equals y. Right. So here's the, the mutual information. And it has the nice property that the variables would be uh, uh, independent if and only if this is zero. So that's uh, uh, that's this reconstructibility notion captures the fact that we have uh, information correlated with the root spin uh, uh, arbitrarily far down the tree. So that's a, that's the first task we'll be uh, we'll be interested in, uh, and then we may ask for a harder task. Uh, which is so-called census reconstruction. If I am given uh, uh, not the tree to depth d, but only the spins of the nodes at depth d, and even less than, well, if I don't know the tree, I, I can only count how many uh, individuals at generation d have uh, such or such trait. Uh, this is what we call the census. If we do a census of the population today, we count how many have brown eyes, how many have blue eyes, and we have uh, got these counts. Can we, from these counts, uh, infer non-trivially what was the, the color of the eyes of uh, Adam or Eve? Uh, <clears throat> so that's census reconstruction, and formally this is um, going to hold census re reconstructibility if the mutual information between the, the spin at the root, sigma r, and the, the census uh, in generation D does not vanish as D goes to infinity, all right? Uh, and so, um, indeed, we need to specify what the tree is, and for us, it will be a Galton-Watson branching tree, and the critical parameter will be the average number of children per, per individual. So, uh, that will be alpha. So, the parameters of the model will be P, the stochastic matrix, and alpha, the uh, branching number of the tree, if you like. And uh, of particular interest will be the case where the number of children of uh, a given node will follow a Poisson distribution with parameter alpha. Oh. We do you assume that the matrix P, the stochastic matrix, uh, is known or is it known? I, I'll assume it's known, yes. I'll assume it's known. So we know the parameters of the model and we try to, to answer these two questions. <coughs> when is the uh, uh, problem, uh, the tree reconstruction problem feasible? When it is, uh, when is the census reconstruction feasible. Okay, um, so uh, perhaps one thing to mention uh, is that we can uh, introduce notation uh, mu r s d which is the probability that sigma r equals s given g d and so we have that uh, i of sigma r GD will be <coughs> given by uh, sum over S. So uh, I did not mention that, but I will use Q as the number of possible traits of uh, each individual. And so uh, the spin values will uh, uh, run over the integers from 1 to Q. And so uh, this mutual information would be then uh, mu R S D log of mu r s d over mu s. So that's a convenient property. And uh, from this, actually, we can uh, see at once that the uh, task is going to be uh, <coughs> impossible. If this will go to zero as d goes to infinity if and only if uh, <coughs> the distribution mu uh, s d will go to mu s, will converge in probability to the det deterministic distribution mu s. Right. Okay, 
And uh, one more thing to note is that this must converge almost surely to a limit because <coughs> this is uh, <coughs> the expectation of a, a random variable conditional to some information structure. And actually, we can uh, see this. We can enlarge this information structure by <coughs> giving also the, the spin values below uh, level D, D plus 1, etc., revealing also the tree below that. But the conditional independence properties we have in this model make sure that, so maybe I can write that. So I can write HD. This is the information contained in the full tree. And in uh, uh, sigma L, uh, D plus J, J greater than zero. So uh, because of conditional independence of HD and uh, sigma R given GD, I have that UR SD is also the probability that sigma R equals S given HD. And this decreases with D, so <coughs> this must converge almost surely to uh, limiting uh, distribution and that would be the probability that sigma r equals s given that I might call h infinity which is the limiting information structure infinitely far down uh, the tree. All right? uh, so perhaps uh, another remark uh, is that these limits must exist and uh, <coughs> that is something that follows from a basic uh, inequality in information theory. I have that, for instance, sigma r and x d plus 1 are independent <coughs> when I condition uh, on x d. This is a Markov random field property of my, my propagation model. So uh, if I reveal, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, that's, that's true for the, the Galton Watson branching process. Uh, so uh, this implies, and this is a basic data processing inequality of information theory, that the information. Uh, common to xd plus 1 and sigma r must be less than the information between xd and sigma r. So we have actually decreasing sequences. So the limits exist, there's no problem with that. So uh, the first result that I want to, uh, to present now is a, a characterization of when uh, census reconstructibility is feasible and when it is not. And that uh, uh, is uh, covered uh, in, in greater generality than I, I will tell you in a paper by uh, uh, Hanan Mosel and Yuval Perez in uh, 2003. Uh, and to state the result, we need to uh, describe the spectrum of the uh, uh, stochastic matrix P. And so the result is as follows. Uh, we know it's a stochastic matrix, we know its largest eigenvalue, if we order them by uh, absolute value, is 1. Uh, so let's uh, take lambda 2, the second largest eigenvalue in modulus. And so the, the result is as follows. We have reconstructibility if alpha, the average number of children, times the square of this uh, second eigenvalue is uh, strictly larger than 1. And we do not have reconstructibility, census reconstructibility, if it is strictly less than that. Okay? And in the equality case, they show that for certain types of trees, then it's not reconstructible. So we would want to say it fails if it's less than or equal to 1, but it is not shown for every situation. Uh, so I, I'd like to explain to some extent uh, the arguments in the proof. I'll be much more sketchy uh, further uh, in, in, the, in the talk, but uh, for this one I think it's important because 
it will uh, allow us to understand why we keep talking about this Kasten Stevens threshold and where it comes from. Really, we will see that in trying to prove uh, this result. So, um, let me. Uh, is there an eraser somewhere? Oh, uh, there are plenty here. Okay. There's even a big one. <coughs> no, no theorem about uh, reconstructivity, non, I, I mean non-census, uh, li like that. Uh, I, I'll talk about ah, it. Okay. I'll talk about it. Uh, yes, so I'll quote theorems. I, I will uh, give one implication in one direction. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about reconstructivity afterwards. But I want first to convey what is this Kesten Stiglund threshold and that uh, characterizes the census reconstructivity. So, uh, uh, the proof goes as follows for the feasibility <coughs> case. So let's assume alpha uh, lambda 2 square is larger than 1. Then we can form from the census... Uh, okay, so first uh, let's take x in uh, r to the q an eigenvector of p which is associated with this uh, lambda 2 eigenvalue and now we can form a, a random variable zd which is by definition the sum of our spins i in a level d of the entry of this eigenvector x uh, evaluated at the spin of that node. And so we will, this is a function of uh, the census because you can write it also sum over S of <coughs> XS times capital S XSD. So that's really a function of what we call the census. Uh, and we'll show that in fact this already contains enough information to do non trivial reconstruction. Um, <coughs> so how do we do that? Uh, we use martingale convergence arguments and uh, to, to uh, do that we introduce uh, a proper information structure, filtration and the, <coughs> the one that will be adequate for us is uh, the <coughs> information present in uh, the tree to level D and all the spins of nodes to level D so I note that sigma VD, where uh, VD uh, is the set of nodes in the tree to level D. Okay, and so uh, we'll show that this is a, a martingale for this information structure, that it converges to a limit that still carries information about the spin at the root. So, uh, why is it a martingale? So, if we look at expectation of ZD conditional and fd minus 1, we can, uh, oh, I forgot to normalize, yes, I, I, need, a, I need a term, uh, I need lambda 2 alpha to the d here, if I really want it to be a martingale. Uh, <coughs> so, that will be lambda 2 alpha to the minus d times the expectation and I want to uh, make ZD minus 1 appear, so I write it this way. And sum of our nodes in level D minus 1. And then I'll, uh, actually I'll move the expectation inside. And I have the uh, expectation of the sum of D such that the apparent is I of X sigma J given... Uh, Fd minus 1. So that's the first part of, of the calculation showing this is a, a martingale. And so uh, we know there are on average alpha children, and we know <coughs> that conditional on the spin of their parent sigma i, the spin downwards will be uh, t with probability p sigma i t. So this uh, reads lambda 12 fat to minus d sum of our i in fd minus 1 and now we have uh, 
uh, we have sum over t of alpha p, s, p sigma i t x t. So now we leverage the uh, eigenvector property. That would be uh, precisely the summation of t x sigma i uh, times lambda 2. And so, okay, I can cram it on this board. So I, I will indeed get lambda 2 alpha to the minus d plus 1 uh, sum over i in ld minus 1 of x sigma i. So <coughs> that's precisely uh, zd minus 1. So that, that's the part that does not depend on the assumption. It is always a martingale whether we are above or below the Kesten-Stigum uh, threshold. And so now uh, let's uh, leverage this Kesten-Stigum assumption. Uh, <coughs> And we uh, leverage it by showing that the martingale has a bounded second moment. And if it has a bounded second moment, it is uniformly integrable. And if it is, then we have a, a <coughs> theorem that tells us that uh, it converges almost surely and in L1 to limiting uh, <coughs> random variables. So the martingale convergence result is if supremum over d of uh, expectation of zd square is finite, then there exists z infinity such that uh, z is precisely the expectation of z uh, infinity given fd. So that will, uh, that will suffice for us to prove that Uh, we, we have uh, information uh, in ZD, arbitrarily large D, about the spin root because uh, we'll have that. Um, may, maybe I'll prove that and then I, I'll go back to how we extract information based on this property. Okay, so uh, to do this, we look at the variance now, and that's where we, sh we see the Kesten Stigum condition appear. So the variance of Zd we write as uh, the variance of expectation of Zd given Fd minus 1 plus the expectation of the variance conditional Zd minus uh, uh, conditional Fd minus 1. So the first one by the Martingale property, this is just variance of Zd, whereas the second one, this is the expectation, and now uh, if we look at the Poisson situation, we will have uh, <coughs> something that will be um, <coughs> sum over uh, i in Ld minus 1, and we'll have up to some constant uh, a term that is uh, uh, the variance of a Poisson random variable with a, a bounded mean. So maybe I, I should not detail this too much. Let me just say that we have a term that is less than constant times 1 for each uh, of the, for each of the uh, <coughs> nodes in level uh, d minus 1, the contribution to the variance is order 1. Okay? I have Morally, each of them contributes uh, an offspring, uh, offspring of type uh, T, let's say, we uh, will have a Poisson distribution with a parameter alpha P sigma I T. This is going to be multiplied by X T. So we'll have a constant. We can take the supremum of this X T. We'll, have, we'll just have things that uh, can be bounded uniformly for all I. And then we have one contribution per node at uh, level uh, d minus 1. So, uh, except, okay, that I forgot again my lambda 2 uh, alpha to the minus 2d that pops out when I take the, uh, uh, the variance. Okay? It is at d minus 1 for the first term, not d minus 1. Yes, you're right. Sorry. Okay, so um, 
All right, so now, now we can leverage the, uh, uh, the uh, assumption I have because um, the expectation of sum over i in Ld minus 1 of 1, this is precisely alpha to the d. And so I have that variance of Zd is less than variance of Z d minus 1 plus up to a constant. And now I have my term uh, <coughs> and that to square alpha to the minus d. So I have cancellation of uh, an alpha to the d term. And so this is less than uh, c sum over <coughs> all integers of uh, this uh, and then uh, to square times alpha to the minus k, so this is uh, indeed uh, less than, than another constant. So the uh, kesten stigum condition implies that we have a uniformly integrable martingale. Uh, <coughs> and now, let's look at uh, the expectation of this martingale conditional on uh, on, uh, on the root spin, and that's precisely x sigma r. And so one thing we need to remark now is that since we have an eigenvector that is associated with a, an eigenvalue that is not the trivial one of this stochastic matrix, this is lambda 2 is distinct from 1, then <coughs> um, the uh, uh, eigenvector cannot be constant because the all one's vector is an eigenvector associated with the one eigenvalue. So this is not constant, and hence uh, uh, we, we, if we want to have a mean for this limiting random variable that is uh, conditionally, conditionally on the spin at the root uh, uh, dependent on, on this spin at the root, we cannot have independence. So I, I think I, I can uh, skip detailing that, but this is really what drives the uh, reconstructibility uh, property. Okay, uh, so for the other direction, uh, I'll just uh, I'll just mention a theorem by Kesten and Stigum that is instrumental in showing that we cannot hope to uh, uh, achieve reconstructibility based on the census if uh, <coughs> if we are below the threshold. So the, the theorem by uh, Kesten and Stigum says the following thing. So if alpha lambda 2 squared is less than 1, we have that uh, taking x as d, the number of individuals at depth d of type of uh, spin s, if we normalize by their expected, uh, subtracting their expected value. Now if we... Uh, take an appropriate no normalization. We look at this, so for all q, then this will converge in distribution as d goes to infinity to a Gaussian random variable with a, a covariance matrix with a, which is independent on of sigma r, so that's conditionally on sigma r, the limiting distribution is independent of the, of the spin root uh, value. So uh, that's instrumental in the proof. You need further steps in order to, to deduce the property, but, uh, but this is really what the crux of the proof, and so that was done in 66 by, by Kesten and Stigum. Okay, so uh, this one I wanted to give some details. I'll be uh, much more sketchy uh, from, from now on. Um, so I, I'll now mention the other threshold we were considering, uh, which was uh, reconstructibility. So that was all about census reconstructibility. We, we have this case and stigma threshold. Now what about uh, reconstructibility? Well, uh, the information about uh, the root that is captured uh, by the uh, spins uh, in level D and the tree between the root and level D 
can be uh, summarized in the conditional distribution of this pin at the root, given uh, the information we have. And it turns out that there is an algorithm that allows us to recursively uh, determine this distribution. This is the so-called belief propagation algorithm that's been uh, discovered several times and is usually attributed to Judy Apple uh, in 82. Uh, <clears throat> and so, uh, um, basically, to determine the, the uh, distribution of uh, a spin at a particular node, given uh, its, um, its descendants at level D, so let, let's have a tree like that. We have node I here, and then it has some descendants at level D that I call LID, and then you have the whole of uh, uh, level D here. So uh, by ha applying uh, the conditional independence property plus the Bayes formula, you can really in a couple of lines, establish this uh, recursive formula for uh, these conditional distributions of a uh, node spin knowing its descendants uh, in uh, generation D. And so that's also called the sum product algorithm. So basically, uh, this distribution for node <coughs> i is given by a product over its uh, sums of a sum of its sums distribution conditionally on their own descendants uh, in generation D, and you have an appropriate normalization which involves matrix P as well as uh, the stationary distribution nu of P. And so uh, that's something you can uh, propagate upwards towards the root, and you need to initialize it properly by uh, uh, taking the Dirac mass at the true value of the spin uh, <coughs> that you do observe in generation D. So, that's an algorithm, but this gives you, if you compute it, all the information there is to, uh, to know uh, <coughs> about the, the uh, quantity of interest, which is the, the uh, spin at the root. But this is, besides being a, an algorithm, this is also an analytical tool, uh, <coughs> in particular. Um, because of this, you can uh, recurs find the recursion for the distribution of this conditional uh, law, given the information at level D, uh, for the, the spin at the root, uh, given that this spin at the root takes a particular value T. And so this is a, a, simple, uh, a simple fact. You, you can condition on the value uh, of the uh, spin at the root, let's say T. You can determine its number of children D. You can determine the spins of its children, then conditionally on that, the messages that come back from level D using the <coughs> BP recursion uh, will necessarily uh, correspond to, uh, if you go down to level D plus 1, they will correspond to what you would have uh, taking the information from level D. So, in other words, we have for this pi D a recursion that is called the density evolution, that is, uh, uh, <coughs> that is as follows. So pi D plus 1 is characterized as the law of the uh, outcomes of the uh, BP algorithm if we plugged in uh, uh, inputs in that recursion that were distributed according to pi D. Okay? So um, <coughs> this is in this sense that uh, belief propagation is not just an algorithm, but it is also an analytical tool. Because once we are equipped with this density evolution equation, we can deduce things about uh, uh, the feasibility or not of the reconstruction task. Okay. So uh, something I've already mentioned is that uh, re non-reconstructibility amounts to this distribution of the conditional law of the root spin uh, converging to the Dirac mass on the uh, unconditional distribution. And so there is something that can be deduced from this consideration about this density evolution <coughs> equation, which is if there is a unique fixed point for this density evolution equation, uh, it has to be the trivial one. Okay? And since uh, uh, 
the uh, conditional distribution of the root spin given the information at level D uh, has a limit and that this limit must satisfy uh, uh, must be a fixed point hence if there's only one fixed point we know for sure that our reconstructibility is doomed okay and so in, in a paper by Andrea and, and Mark Meza in 2006 they, uh, they claim this but also they show the converse that uh, at least when the uh, spin distribution at equilibrium is uniform, then uh, non-uniqueness implies reconstructibility. So if you have non-uniqueness, you can craft signals uh, from the spins at level D, propagate them upwards, and you'll get something that is non-trivial, that uh, contains non-vanishing information uh, about the, the uh, spin as a root. So uh, a further use of this... Uh, uh, density evolution equation was made by uh, Alan Sly in 2009 uh, where he established something that was T, their spin values will be uncorrelated. That's what's given by that. And, uh, um, and we can deduce that if true reconstruction fails, indeed uh, block reconstruction in the associated uh, community detection uh, problem fails. But did the converse is true as well? Because uh, it seems that since you have a locally you see a tree and locally your uh, random field has the, the same uh, structure as in the tree, if you can reconstruct on the tree, then you would be able to reconstruct on the graph. And well, I... on the tree you get to see the spins at a far away distance, yet you don't get in the graph. So you you have you are you are stuck at generation log of n. You mean? It's it's not yeah, that in the, the tree we have cycles or this is so if you can reconstruct on the tree that means that if you look at uh, the the tree you see uh, two points d then you have some information on the root right if I look at the shape of the tree and at the spins at yes. distance right yes. and since locally in the graph you see a tree if you explore not too far up to this yes, yes, yes. that means that. In the graph, if you explore a two distance log n and you see your tree shape, then you, if tree reconstruction works, that means you, you should be able to tell something about the, the spin in the graph. Uh, not, not necessarily. Not necessarily. So uh, may, maybe I show plots, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I can, I you don't can... observe any labels. You, you don't, don't observe any the... spins. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the tree, they give you the spins at the bottom. Ah, Here, uh -huh. they don't give you any spins. Ah, d'accord, I see. Uh -huh. the, you just have to grab the tree. Just the tree, yeah. You can do anything. Ah, okay, okay. okay. Mm. Okay, but the, the converse, I mean, it is tempting to say if true reconstruction holds, then I can surely reconstruct the dose. I think not. So, but we have the experts in the room to, to uh, uh, give us more, more insight into that. But, uh, the, but uh, always tree construction means you, you are given the labels. Yes, in the far the away, but block reconstruction, you are not no given labels. Labels. You are no labels. Given. You want to ah, cluster so nodes, that's, that's but you just see the graph. No labels uh, anywhere. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, we, we have a sufficient. Uh, condition for impossibility of the task. We can just look at the true reconstruction if it's uh, failed, the committee detection is failed as well. Uh, let's see now that there is indeed a region where we have uh, reconstructibility but we are still below the kesten stigum threshold. So uh, that, that's uh, an argument that was made by uh, 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 Banks et al. In, in a paper in 2016 uh, for the symmetric stochastic block model, which is, if you like, the, uh, 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 the one corresponding to the symmetric POTS model. So the way they parameterize it is uh, uh, to take as the RST matrix uh, two parameters, C in on the diagonal, and then C out uh, of the diagonal. Uh, so it's fairly straightforward to determine the kesten stigum condition on that. The, mean number of neighbors that would be seen plus q minus 1 c out over q and uh, I think the uh, uh, okay 
never mind the, the exact value of the, the this is a, a simple uh, algebra. Um, and so uh, what what they show is that for this model, for Q larger than or equal to 4, uh, then uh, you can have uh, reconstruction in the stronger of the two senses that I've proposed, so uh, strictly positive overlap, uh, while being below the distance Stigum threshold. And so let me try to, uh, to explain briefly the idea of the argument. So, uh, so you can uh, consider a sigma hat i uh, uh, an assignment of labels to nodes that creates a balanced uh, partition. That is to say, uh, some of our i of uh, nodes i labeled s, this is uh, n over q. And uh, <coughs> then we, we can consider good partitions. These are balanced. And moreover, they, uh, they put the correct number of edges crossing the boundaries of the true blocks and uh, those internal to the, uh, <coughs> to the um, uh, blocks. So I, I can uh, pull m in of uh, sigma hat. This is the number of uh, uh, so uh, Okay, so <clears throat> maybe it's a good time to take a five minute break. <laughs> 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 Uh, world, we have a graph that we observe. We want to show that there is a hard phase where you can reconstruct non trivially the underlying blocks, but still you are below this Kesten Stigum threshold. So, Kesten Stigum threshold, we will see, is a good candidate for an information uh, computational threshold. Yeah. And so, the, the point here is to show that. You can do something non-trivial even if you're below that. So that the, the white region in the first diagram I, I showed is not empty. And so uh, Banks et al. They <laughs> consider the symmetric stochastic block model and they proved indeed that this uh, white region exists. And uh, so I'm trying to give the, the gist of their argument. Uh, it goes as follows. You take uh, <coughs> a candidate partition of uh, the nodes into... Uh, into um, blocks uh, uh, of equal size, a balanced partition, then you will insist on the number of edges crossing these blocks you draw and the number of edges internal to these blocks you draw to be close to what it would be uh, on average if you had the true partition. So if you know the parameters of the model, you can compute that. So you <coughs> 
Similarly, I would uh, define m in of sigma hat the number of edges uh, internal to the partition I'm considering. And so, a good partition is one such that uh, these numbers, they don't deviate too much from what you would like them to be if you have the true partition. So that's the expected number under the true partition. And so they have special conditions which look like that. So they enforce that. Right? And so, uh, given these conditions, you can take exponential time, check all the balanced partitions, check if these hold, and if one uh, satisfies the criterion, you stop. And what they show is that for some parameter ranges, any uh, balanced partition that satisfies this must have an overlap that is uh, lower bounded away from zero. And the way they do that is by uh, uh, applying the first moment method. They just look at the expectation of the number of balanced partition that satisfy those and yet that have an overlap that is below a particular value. And so by playing with combinatories, they show this must go to zero as n goes to infinity. And so they, this is uh, the idea behind their argument. So using the first moment method and the proper notion of a good partition, they, they reduce the problem to a combinatorial problem. Okay, so the white region exists. Okay, and that's something that was expected from the result uh, of Sly in 2009 on the tree, that there is an intermediate region, but okay. Uh, again, can, can we have a diagram where we superimpose the three regions with the uh, plural and the regions we know on graphs so that... Uh, okay, I, uh, let, let me try. So, uh, okay, so that was Q and I guess uh, C uh, in, that was. And so the so one that's I... for tree or for graph? Uh, so... Yes. <laughs> we don't we don't know for sure. Okay. So that's KS. And so we know this is easy. Well, that's what I'm going to tell you next. For graphs, you can do in polynomial time something like <coughs> zero. And we know census reconstruction is uh, is in this yes. region. So the, the diagram I, I was uh, drawing was uh, here three recon uh, non reconstruction. And so we know that for graph it's not possible as well? Yes. And so, uh, and here the transition appears, so it's distinct for Q equals 4. Okay, they start diverging. And for, uh, so that's the tree diagram. And now you would put something like that. And so it would be feasible but hard for. Uh, graphs in this narrower white range and impossible below but we don't expect these two boundaries to be one and the same okay now it's perfect okay um, all right so <laughs> let's move on uh, to uh, uh, above the kesten stigum threshold uh, and also the, the, uh, the point is to uh, see what can be done above here and so, uh, there's been a very inspiring conjecture made in a paper by uh, uh, Alenka and co-authors, Dessel et al. in 2011, saying, well, if you are in this region, you can consider belief propagation, which, I mean, if we take inspiration from the tree uh, situation, this is the best thing there is. You just need to initialize it correctly. So, <clears throat> their conjecture was, if you initialize BP with uh, random distributions, and you let it run, then it's going to converge, and the converging uh, uh, distributions of uh, belief propagation will be such that you have non-vanishing mutual information between the true spins and the distributions that are the fixed points you converge to. Uh, and numerically, it just seems to be true. So that's so. So just the, it's just the structure that tells you. 
So you, so, initial, you, so you see, you, if you initialize with the uniform distribution, in the symmetric case, you stay at the uniform distribution, nothing happens. If you perturb slightly, then some uh, symmetry breaking will take place, and so there's going to be, a, you know, it's a reconstruction is up to a permutation, so one permutation will win, and you'll end up having a fixed point that tends to predict correctly according to this permuted uh, mapping of the labels. So that, that's their prediction, and it's, uh, it's uh, really consistent with the numerical e evaluations. Um, but it's still standing, I mean, it's still open. Uh, it's very hard to uh, characterize sharply the dynamics of belief propagation in those models. So it's, it's, uh, it's not uh, known, it's, well, it's strongly believed, but it's not proven, let's say. And so here's a, a picture, uh, I mean, trying to convey some intuition for what's going on here. So here I'm drawing uh, if I take for Q the posterior distribution of this uh, spin vector given the graph that I observe, and uh, X would be a candidate overlap measure, so I might consider some kind of large deviations functional of this overlap, so say minus 1 over N log of Q of those spin assignments uh, such that the overlap is a particular X, and so uh, the intuition for, for uh, uh, these transitions could be as follows. If you're in the non-reconstructible phase, the large deviations are like that. So uh, the bulk of the posterior distribution is on uh, uncorrelated spins. So you don't have information. There's nothing you can do. In the hard phase, uh, the posterior distribution would have a non-vanishing mass on correlated spins. So it's a uh, it's useful signal. If you could sample from the posterior distribution, then you would get something useful. But uh, the large deviations uh, functional is like that. And belief propagation is uh, trying to move uh, downhill along that curve. And so if uh, the zero overlap uh, uh, vectors uh, are, are stable under those dynamics, then you get stuck. So we don't know how to initialize BP. And so the hard phase is where you get stuck, even though there is uh, uh, information in the posterior distribution. And the easy phase would be uh, <coughs> the trivial fixed point is unstable, so you perturb it slightly, and you go to a good set of, of uh, configurations. Um, so, but uh, as I say, it's not, it's not uh, proven yet, so it led, uh, again, Lenka and co-authors to uh, try and propose something, uh, something else. But before uh, I move to that, let me uh, say that the next idea that comes to mind is uh, take uh, off-the-shelf methods. So spectral methods are very popular. In that context, what that might mean is take the adjacency matrix, extract the eigenvectors of the leading eigenvalues, and then try to use the coordinates of the corresponding eigenvectors for each given node as uh, information about the underlying spin. Uh, it turns out this fails uh, in, in those random graph models when uh, the average degree is order one, uh, because the, the spectrum tends to be uh, you know, flattening, well, extending uh, away from a bulk, and you have large eigenvalues uh, that tend to be <coughs> uh, triggered by high degree nodes. So in a sparse random graphs, the degrees tend to be distributed uh, as Poisson random variables, and when the mean is order one, then uh, you have fluctuations, you don't have concentration to the mean, so you have degrees of order log n over log log n, typically, and this would induce uh, eigenvalues that are like the square root of that, and the corresponding eigenvector would be a bit like the eigenvector of a star graph centered at this point. So, high value at this vertex, small values uh, at the neighboring sites, and even smaller further away. And so these are not correlated. So, uh, hence uh, the proposal by Lenka et al, uh, they have a very uh, nice name for that, they call it the spectral redemption, because you need to, uh, uh, to salvage uh, classical spectral methods. And so uh, they, they propose to stick to BP but linearize it. So you take the BP iteration, 
and you uh, linearize it around the trivial fixed point. So you can write your messages passed from node i to node j as uh, uh, the distribution us, that's the trivial fixed point, and uh, times 1 plus some perturbation, and you just do a, 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 an expansion, and so you find a very nice structure for the BP uh, iteration. It's a tensor product between a matrix indexed by the oriented edges, so BP works on oriented edges passing on distributions along each oriented edge, so uh, here you see the tensor product between a matrix that is uh, uh, indexed by the oriented edges of the graph and a matrix of size uh, Q by Q, which is precisely the P matrix that uh, you have in the uh, uh, tree reconstruction problem. Uh, so what is this matrix B? This is a non-backtracking matrix, uh, which would put a 1 uh, on entries U to V, X to Y, if you... Uh, <coughs> to v feeds into x to y, so that is v is equal to x, but x to y does not backtrack uh, on u to v, that is uh, uh, y is not equal to u. Okay, so that, that's uh, the picture here. And so um, their uh, spectral redemption conjecture was if we cannot prove uh, that vp works, then maybe we can prove that a spectral method based on the non-backtracking matrix does work. Uh, okay, one, one, one more word about this uh, non-backtracking matrix. It's asymmetric, so we are not no longer in the realm of Hermitian mat matrices, so it's, it's a bit nastier to, to uh, uh, analyze. Uh, and it encodes in a very succinct manner uh, the number of non-backtracking walks that you can have of the graph G. So if you take the case power of B and look at the entry E to F, what you will find is the number of non-backtracking paths of length uh, k plus 1 edges, starting with edge E and ending with edge F. Alright, so uh, what I want to describe next is, is a, a result we had with Charles Bordeneuve and Marc Lelarge, where we, we indeed confirmed the prediction of this spectral redemption uh, that you can do uh, in polynomial time uh, correlated reconstruction uh, in this stochastic block model when above the Kesten-Stigum threshold uh, by uh, processing the eigenvectors of this uh, non-backtracking matrix. So uh, it's, it's a bit uh, heavy to parse this slide, but let, let's, uh, let's try that. So uh, what it says uh, in a nutshell is that the, there are some eigenvalues of uh, what I call the mean progeny matrix, M, which is uh, P times alpha. Okay, I, I, I think I introduced that on an earlier slide, but I might not have mentioned it. So M is alpha times P, okay? And so uh, it has a, a Q eigenvalues, lambda I of M, and some of them will be found almost identically in the uh, non-backtracking matrix spectrum, while others will be lost in a bulk, and those that will stand out and be uh, present in the uh, spectrum unchanged of the non-backtracking matrix B will be precisely those that satisfy the Kesten-Stigum condition. That is to say, those for which uh, their square, lambda i of m squared, will be larger than alpha, which is just lambda 1 of m. Okay. And so uh, that's, uh, that's the statement about the, uh, the eigenvalues. So R0 is the largest index for which an eigenvalue lambda i of m satisfies the Kesten-Stigum condition. And so they are present in the spectrum of B, whereas all the other eigenvalues of B are uh, caught in a bulk, which is a disk of radius square root of a lambda 1 of m. Maybe I, I'll, I'll not talk too much about the eigenvectors, but we have results also on the corresponding eigenvectors. When, when an eigenvalue stands out, is out of the bulk, we can uh, uh, characterize the corresponding eigenvector, when this eigenvalue is simple, as uh, being nearly parallel to an eigenvector that we can construct from the matrix B somehow. Uh, and this is what we leverage to prove that a spectral method, you know, taking the matrix B, extracting the eigenvalues, the corresponding eigenvectors, pick the right one, 
then this is a, a, an eigenvector indexed by oriented edges, so we may project it down to a, a vector indexed by nodes. Uh, this is what this projection does. So for node uh, u, I sum up the entries of uh, edges pointing outside of u, and then I get my, my uh, uh, vari variate for the node u, and this uh, carries some information about the underlying spins, uh, uh, yeah, so that, that's uh, how one shows that the, the, the uh, spectrum of B uh, allows to do in polynomial time uh, uh, correlated reconstruction. Okay, I, I think I don't want to pass this uh, definition of the vector because it's not uh, that, unless, unless someone insists. But okay. uh, all right. Me, so, sorry, so, so, so the uh the output of this theorem is that you have a you have a good way to construct uh, this sigma hat, or you have a good a good choice of sigma hat. Yes, yes. So you take you take b, you extract the spectrum, you pick an eigenvector, you project it down to a vector on r to the n, and then uh, you know that you get a scalar for each uh, for each node, and this scalar is uh, uh, positively correlated, carries information about the speed. And so then, so you, 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 but you can choose. I mean, what's, how do you choose the eigenvalue? How do you, you choose the index i? So mm -hmm. if we are still in that game where we know the parameters, mm -hmm. we have revealed uh, matrix M, uh, p, alpha, <coughs> etc. Then we can just uh, look it up and say, oh well, there's an eigenvalue that satisfies the Kesten-Stegun threshold. So uh, <coughs> I know I, I should be able to find an eigen corresponding eigenvalue in the spectrum of. Uh, uh, of B. Maybe I'll show you this picture, so maybe this is the better answer. So that's uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, an instance of this stochastic block model. This is the spectrum of the non backtracking matrix. So it's uh, uh, on the complex plane because we, we uh, have non-symmetry. Uh, non and so uh, you have the peron frobenius eigenvalue, which is uh, real positive. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you may draw, you know, a circle of width, the square root of this peron frobenius <coughs> eigenvalue, and that's what you would call the bulk of, uh, of this spectrum. And if you find eigenvalues that are close to the real axis and that are in between the peron frobenius eigenvalue and the bulk, these are the right ones for your reconstruction. So that's something that you can do uh, from a data-driven perspective. If you get the model parameters, you, you can even predict that you will find them there. Okay. Um, all right. So um, uh, may, maybe okay. Maybe I should say a word on the eigenvectors and um, why that holds. Uh, actually, my question is about actually if you just, if you have more than two eigenvalues outside of the circle, outside of the bulk, can you choose uh, any? You choose the, the, the first non-trivial one or the largest non-trivial one? Or oh. You had the lambda 3, lambda yeah. 4, which was outside. If you're in, just in the game of that thing, I, I can extract signal. I'm not in, in, insisting on catching as much signal as possible than take any. Okay. Uh, but certainly you could do better by taking all of them that are outside the bulk. We don't quite know uh, how we should do that if we wanted to, but uh, okay, you just need one to prove that. Uh, Reconstruction can be done. Uh, maybe I should just say a word uh, about uh, this, this eigenvector construction. So if I uh, if I consider uh, a vector, uh, so that that starts by taking y in R to the e, the oriented edges, uh, <coughs> such that y u v equals x i of uh, u, uh, sorry, of sigma u, where x i is a eigenvector of m that is associated with an eigenvalue lambda i of m. And now if I look, say, at uh, e transpose l uh, y, uh, an <coughs> edge u to v for some power l, then what I will have is something like that. If my uh, neighborhood is uh, tree-like, 
I will eventually have a summation uh, over uh, nodes at distance L of uh, x sigma i for those nodes at distance L. And so, <coughs> uh, invoking the coupling of the neighborhood with a tree, I can uh, relate this to the martingales I was using for the census reconstruction. And so, <coughs> that would converge on the tree as n goes to infinity to some uh, delta infinity uh, u to v, uh, limiting random variable, if I uh, renormalize by uh, alpha lambda i, say, uh, to the minus L, after proper renormalization, that would converge to a limiting thing. And now you can uh, get a feel for why this is a good candidate for an eigenvector, because if I, <coughs> if I replace the entries of this vector by d lambda i to the L times a limiting, eigen, uh, limiting value, then I have that d transpose of uh, d transpose to the L y u to v, that would be again something like alpha lambda i to the l plus 1 delta infinity of u to v. So <coughs> I find that approximately the Martingale convergence theorem gives me a, a kind of uh, eigenvalue eigenvector uh, equation where the eigenvalue would be uh, uh, alpha lambda i, so here, okay, I've been using the notations from the uh, census reconstruction, so that would be, we had alpha lambda i of p, so that's lambda i of m, which is just, okay, so that, that's one part of the intuition, but you need to work quite a bit to, uh, to really show that indeed the eigenvectors can be constructed, and in fact, this does not suffice, you see this is a bit more complex, the construction of the candidate eigenvectors, we need to apply B transpose L times, but then B L times. So there's a, this is for technical reasons. Uh, okay, so we, we, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, then uh, the result that in polynomial time we can achieve uh, reconstruction above the test sensitive threshold. So uh, one thing I wanted to, uh, uh, to tell you about is a relationship between those results on the non-backtracking spectrum and results uh, <coughs> in the random matrix uh, theory literature. Um, <coughs> so uh, there, there's a, a, a line of work about uh, characterizing the spectra of deformed uh, large random matrices. So the, the canonical model of a random matrix is the Wigner uh, random matrix, which is a matrix that is Hermitian, uh, whose entries are independent up to this uh, symmetry, and uh, uh, they are Gaussian, so you would have uh, W, I, J, would be a Gaussian with variance sigma squared over N for uh, I less than J, and on the diagonal you would double the, the variance, let's say, so that, that's the prototypical uh, uh, random matrix, and it's been studied a lot. Uh, in the 50s, Wigner showed that the, uh, for fixed sigma, as uh, uh, n goes to infinity, the uh, spectral measure, the empirical distribution of, of the eigenvalues, converges to this semicircle low, which uh, uh, has density uh, given here. Uh, and so, uh, Baik, Benarus, and Peche characterize, uh, characterize the impact on the spectrum of such a Wigner matrix if you add a low rank matrix to it that is independent of, of, uh, of the Wigner <coughs> matrix W. Um, so, uh, hence the name BBP or Baik, Benarus, Peche phase transition. So, uh, specifically, they consider an n times n symmetric matrix P. Uh, with fixed rank Q, fixed spectrum as well, we scale the, the quantities to be order 1. Uh, and uh, similarly to the notation I was using for uh, discussing the, the kesten stigum threshold, I'll introduce R0 to be the largest i such that the square of the eigenvalue lambda uh, i of Pn 
uh, exceeds uh, the variance term of the, of the Wigner matrix. And uh, <coughs> so here's a version I took from Benay George and Nadal Kuditi, but this is really this back Benaus crochet transition. Uh, if uh, I satisfy the BBP criterion, you might call it, then the highest largest eigenvalue uh, of W plus the perturbation P uh, is outside the, the, the bulk, so it's larger in absolute value than uh, twice sigma, and it's precisely given by the original eigenvalue lambda I of P plus uh, sigma squared over this lambda I of P. Okay? Uh, whereas if you are uh, uh, for I larger than R naught, the eigenvalue is lost in the bulk. You cannot see it. Uh, and in fact, there is a very a strong parallel between this situation and the one we have in this uh, uh, non-backtracking matrix spectrum of, a, of a, a stochastic block model. So I'll try to, to convey that now. Uh, so first, let's uh, try to read off the stochastic block model, the variance parameter in the Wigner matrix case. So recall we, we would view the adjacency matrix as a signal matrix, block structured, uh, plus the, uh, which is the expectation of the matrix conditioned on the spins. And then uh, we have a noise matrix that is added to it. So uh, sigma squared in BBP is the sum of variances of terms along a, a, a row or a, a column. So in our case, we would sum, you know, these... Uh, uh, R sigma I V over N times uh, 1 minus R sigma I V over N because this is the variance of a, a Bernoulli random variable. So ignoring the lower order terms, we get the sum over, over T of R sigma I T over N. Uh, and uh, if you, <coughs> if you, uh, if you check the model parameters, this just gives you the, uh, uh, the <coughs> uh, parameter alpha. Another way to see this is in those random graph models, the uh, uh, node degrees are asymptotically distributed like a Poisson random variable, and this has variance alpha. So uh, the variance of uh, the, the sum of terms is uh, asymptotically the sum of, of the, uh, the... Okay. It just works out. Okay, and then the signal matrix, P sub N, would correspond to the block matrix I was writing down. And so the spectrum of this one is asymptotic to the spectrum of this mean progeny matrix uh, uh, M uh, that, uh, that we, we saw before. And so the kesten stegum condition, on the one hand, says uh, an eigenvalue will be seen in the non-backtracking spectrum uh, lambda I of M, if its square is larger than alpha, and uh, BBP says uh, an eigenvalue uh, lambda I of the deformation matrix P will be visible if its square is larger than, <coughs> than uh, sigma squared. And so by this identification, we find that this is one and the same uh, criterion for uh, being visible in the spectrum of a particular matrix. Um, so we I'll try perhaps to push this parallel a bit further now, uh, because, okay, we, we have uh, the same criterion for eigenvalues being visible, but in one case we see them in the non backtracking spectrum, in the other case we see them directly in the spectrum. Um, and uh, the difference being we, we look in the SBM at sparse situations, we have sparse random graphs, whereas with Wigner matrices we are in a different regime, we have a non-sparse uh, uh, matrices. So let, let's try to, to push the, par the parallel a bit further, and for, for that I will uh, quote a formula that is the so-called ihara bass formula that links uh, the uh, the spectrum, oh, there's a B missing here, it should be I, uh, identity matrix minus Z times B. So you have a formula that relates the, the uh, determinant of uh, <coughs> identity minus ZB to the determinant of an N by N matrix, which involves the adjacency matrix of a graph, and a diagonal matrix uh, with on its diagonal the degrees of the nodes minus 1. Okay, so that's the Ihara-Bass formula. This is a known uh, uh, 
for decades now, and it readily implies that uh, an eigenvalue uh, of b, which is not 1 minus 1 or 0, uh, is necessarily, uh, well, it's an if and only if, it's, uh, <coughs> it, it is such an eigenvalue, if and only if, the determinant of lambda squared i minus lambda i, uh, lambda a, minus the same diagonal matrix <coughs> is 0. So now we, we can uh, process that a bit, and uh, if we uh, assume there is concentration of the degrees in our, in our random graph models, we let the alpha parameter go to infinity, uh, sufficiently uh, large so that the uh, deviations, the relative deviations of degrees to their means vanish, uh, <coughs> then any uh, eigenvalue uh, lambda in the spectrum of uh, uh, of uh, the non-backtracking matrix B that is small compared to alpha is necessarily such that lambda plus alpha over uh, lambda up to a tiny perturbation is going to be in the spectrum of the adjacent symmetries. So uh, the way to pass that is uh, that if you let uh, your average degree uh, increase, you move from sparse uh, models to uh, non-sparse ones, then you expect the, uh, uh, the eigenvalues in the non-backtracking matrix to show up in uh, the spectrum of the uh, adjacent symmetrix, modulo the same kind of transformation that is uh, present in the by benarus uh, transition. So that, that makes perhaps the parallel even stronger. Uh, and perhaps another point to take from this, uh, from this uh, calculation is that uh, all the, the, the uh, hassle of uh, constructing the non-backtracking matrix and of uh, uh, extracting its spectrum is needed if you are after sharp thresholds in the, um, in the sparse case, whereas if your models are dense enough, uh, you may uh, just go with the adjacent symmetrics and stick with classical uh, uh, spectral methods. So I was planning to conclude uh, about uh, now uh, with... Uh, so I, if, if it's too early, I can say more things, but uh, <laughs> if, uh, if not, let's conclude. Uh, so, I, there are many exciting developments that I have not covered. So, for instance, I was talking just now about denser models going beyond the sparse case. And in that case, uh, there are very powerful tools that have been developed, in particular by Andrea. There is this so-called approximate message passing uh, set of, of techniques. That, that is really the, the tool of choice now for uh, uh, analyzing non-sparse models. And so if we wanted to have a version of Bag ben peche in, in uh, 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 non-sparse uh, cases, then this, this would probably be a, a, a very uh, promising approach. Uh, I've talked about uh, case density Goom transition a lot, uh, and then about the uh, information theoretic transition for reconstruction. Uh, there are finer phenomena that you can look at, and it, uh, uh, if, if you're interested, you can uh, go and check a, a very recent paper by, by Lenka and uh, uh, Richie Tassangi and, and uh, Senergian, where they, they, they distinguish cases where belief propagation uh, might be, um, be non-trivial, but yet not optimal. So there's even finer categorizations that you can, that, that you can draw. Uh, and about... Uh, uh, I guess w one thing that I, I think very very interesting is a better understanding of the hard phase. To me, it's, it's even understood as of now. So the landscape, for instance, of BP, the, the uh, magnitude of the basins of attraction, the, what are the fixed points, etc. So I think there's a very rich geometry here that, that is worth understanding. And we can also try to understand such landscapes of energy for other dynamics, not just BP. Uh, so that, that's, that's a very uh, exciting, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, way to try and uh, understand algorithmic hardness in those problems. And uh, more generally, I, I would say that statistical physics brings us with a very rich perspective on this computational uh, uh, complexity problem. Uh, by looking at those large instances, we, we see uh, 
phenomena that we would not see otherwise. Uh, we start distinguishing between different phases, uh, <coughs> identifying cases where a uh, very simple algorithm works, situations where it starts to fail. All, all this is, is really a contribution of this perspective on the computational complexity. And with this, uh, I will stop. So uh, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but uh, so um, so when you pass, because you, you look, uh, you take your uh, uh, non backtracking matrix and you look at the power uh, of order log n. Yes. Yes. So if you have pass enough, I agree that you can do it in uh, polynomial time. But uh, no, if no. Not, we we look at powers to characterize the eigenvectors. Yes. And so we prove that the eigenvector uh, carries okay. some signal by showing that the eigenvector... So you, you don't need to... Okay. Yes, that, that's, I, I think, the appeal of this, uh, this spectral method is that you just do the spectral analysis, you pick the eigenvector and you don't need to power it. Okay. Uh, we had looked earlier on at other spectral methods where instead of considering a non-backtracking matrix, you would construct matrices counting self-avoiding uh, paths. And we, we have done some work more recently with Ludovic, who's here, on uh, counting graph distances. Uh, and so these take a bit longer to construct. They, they have other advantages, but uh, the beauty of the non-backtracking matrix is that you just, you know, off the shelf, extract the spectrum, pick the eigenvectors, and you have an algorithm. And so, uh, so you are able to describe pre precisely the, the, the eigenvectors of the outliers, or, 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 or yes, 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 yes. And what, what is the so, what is the result? So the result is uh, it is as if uh, conditional on the spin of the uh, uh, of the endpoints of an edge. So you, you know these are indexed by oriented edges. So you pick an edge u to v, you have spins sigma u, sigma v attached. Conditional on these two spins, the uh, entry of the eigenvector is distributed as uh, the limit of a martingale that we can construct on the associated tree model uh, with, uh, as an initialization point, uh, something that is uh, dictated by those spins. So it's... I mean, this is something you can you can uh, uh, write down. So this is the. It is deterministic at the end. Uh, it's not deterministic. There, there is, is a, there, are there, are, there are fluctuations, but the means we yes. know exactly, and we can we can also compute the variances. These laws are typically complex, so martingale limits that that, that would be a, 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 a not a, an easy to describe. Uh, uh, distribution, but the, the mean and variance we can easily compute. Yeah. And so it's as if you had conditionally on the spins independent martingale limit samples uh, with the proper mean and variance. Yes. And is there at least an, uh, a synthetic description of, of this distribution? Why you really don't know? I, I don't know either. I mean, we can write a fixed point equation for the characteristic function, for instance. So that, that's something we can do. And mm. oh, okay. If, okay. if we are interested in uh, estimating quantiles, we can do that numerically. Mm. I don't think we can, uh, in, in, in general, we can, we can say a lot more. Mm. Normally, if you <coughs> the limit of large degree, you get Gaussians, right? For instance, the theorem of Allen that you quoted at the beginning of reconstruction, you obtained by you know, <coughs> approximating the distribution of a degree of uh, belief by the ocean. Of this right. yeah, this is. Yes, so when the sparsity uh, uh, lessens mm. higher and higher degrees, uh, as Andrea says, no, you have no, averaging no. phenomena. So it's. Uh, Central limit theorems start to kick in, and uh, you have uh, more uh, explicit characterizations. Mm -hmm. 
maybe it becomes, of course, some of them more and more deterministic or more and more concentrated when. Because when, we, when we stick uh, to you know this signal to noise ratio of the other one, so you know, second eigenvalue squared divided by first eigenvalue say one point two, when this stays order one, uh, you cannot hope to be uh, uh, perfect at reconstruction. So this is really uh, the, the right notion of a signal to noise ratio in this reconstruction problem. This becomes uh, very large. Then, indeed, you can hope to, to be uh, asymptotically exact. Yeah. Any question? So, I have a question concerning the uh, characterization of these phase transitions. Because in statistical mechanics, in general, you don't just want to know where the transition is, but you're also interested to what happens when you come close to the transition. So, you have an idea? I mean, the, do people have? A, this heuristic, uh, heuristic uh, behavior of what happens when I, I don't have an idea. But, uh, for instance, the reconstructibility transition, we know uh, from very recently that in some cases exactly where it is, uh, but uh, in general we, we are not sure about where it is. So I think there, there is a conjecture for where it should be. Uh, that's been established rigorously in a paper by Len Kaltal in 2017 for disassortative symmetric stochastic block models. But uh, okay, I would not venture as I said, there's this kind of uh, universality uh, behavior. From a physics point of view, these are kind of similar phase transitions as in, in mean field systems in physics. But, mm, it, People didn't look so much into like the critical behavior. It's not maybe so. It's maybe not the most interesting questions in this context. Well, if you want to, if you transi if this transition is between, a, let's say, a fast algorithm and slow algorithm, maybe you would like to know when you approach the transition from the fast side. I mean, uh, how fast does it stay? I mean, how 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 much? I mean, how fast is it? Or how 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 quick is it? Okay, when you when you approach. Uh, so if you have polynomial decay, for instance, uh, that's the uh, polynomial, polynomial decay uh, rate. Yeah. Does it, so how does it change when you approach So in the dense systems, we have really simple equations that tell you about the convergence time of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. So there you could do, it's just a scalar fixed point equation, so you could analyze all the things. Mm -hmm. I have another question about this, the spectrum of the, the B matrix. So uh, what you say is, is that do you still have to extract if you if you're given the the graph? Do you have to extract uh, by by some uh, uh, numerical? Uh, uh, say, do you have to extract to, to compute exactly the spectrum and then look at the first uh, the first outliers and try to extract statistical information about this? Uh, I mean, my question is, do you, do you need to compute it by by some? Uh, uh, some Lanchos algorithm, for instance, or can you use this this uh, this b b to the l b t to the l uh, method to 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 have at least an approximate? Uh, I guess yes. I guess you could have a good starting point from this. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you you would need to use Lanchos uh, iterations, but you could initialize them mm -hmm. in a smart manner. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have to really to compute the spectrum because this can be a large matrix. But yeah. you don't need to so another remark about uh, computing this spectrum is you know that this correspondence between the uh, spectrum of B and this, uh, in this E Harabas uh, formula. So in, in the paper uh, on the spectral redemption, they also leveraged that to to show that you can really work with n by n matrices. So you, you can cut on the uh, the complexity of it. Okay. No question? So let's thank the speaker.